Okay, so we have four uh, excellent presentations and excellent presenters uh, scheduled for this, uh, this session here. I've asked each presenter to speak for about uh, 12 minutes. We'll be a little bit flexible, uh, a bit flexible on that, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll stick to the schedule to the best that we can so that we have ample time for discussion uh, at the end. I'm gonna do a very brief introduction of the speakers right now, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Rebecca to get us started. So Rebecca, Dr. Rebecca uh, uh, Shirley, <laughs> I think I actually haven't, <laughs> we haven't met in person before, uh, is the uh, Chief of Research at Power for All. Uh, she received her PhD from the Energy and Resource Group at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she's uh, been featured as an ESI Africa Power and Energy Leader in 2019 and was named the African Utility Week's 2018 Outstanding Young Leader in Energy. So we're very excited to have Rebecca. Again, I'm going to do all of the introductions first and then we'll, we'll move on to the presentations. Uh, Kat Harrison is our, will be our next presenter. She's director at 60 Decibels, uh, which is uh, leading the energy impact work that they do there. Uh, she has a lot of experience in the energy access uh, space. She was uh, previously an associate director of impact at uh, Acumen and director of research and impact at SolarAid. She also chaired the impact working group of the Global Off-Grid Energy Sector Association. So we're excited that also to have Kat joining us. Our third presenter is Aaron Ailes. He's a research associate in the energy <coughs> in the Energy for Development Research Group at the University of Strathclyde. He's currently working as a solar microgrid developer on, on a Scottish government funded project uh, in Malawi. He has a background in engineering and has spent 10 years in small wind and solar PV uh, in the solar PV private sector before joining academia. He is currently completing his PhD on solar microgrid social enterprises. And our last uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Aparna Katre. Uh, she is an associate professor and cultural entrepreneurship program director at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Her research interests are the nexus of entrepreneurship, strategy, and design for social change and sustainable de uh, development. And she's done a lot of um, different uh, leadership in the areas of strategy, organizational change management, business process improvement, and program management, at global informa information technology consulting firms. So we're very happy to have her uh, as well. So we'll begin with the panel sessions um, and I'm going to get Rebecca's slides up here. So just give me a, a moment please to put those up. Let's see, are you, are you seeing, Peter, are you seeing the right slides here? Okay, thumbs up. All right, uh, so again, please uh, mute yourself or uh, stay muted and I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Great, thanks a lot, Henry. Thank you so much for having us. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation after the presentations on, on impact. I've just have my video up for a little quick second so that everyone can see me and I can say hi and I will take that off soon, um, just uh, in the interest of bandwidth. Um, so you can move on to the next slide. Um, yes, thank you. Great. So just a bit about Power for All before, before I jump in. Uh, we are an awareness raising organization, um, a nonprofit specifically that's focused on delivering uh, clean energy, um, clean, reliable and affordable power to all, as our title suggests. Um, we were established as a group of practitioners um, uh, about five years ago and have since evolved into a coalition of 300 plus partners working to encourage integrated approaches to electrification. And we do that work through unifying the sector's voice, through producing or sharing data-driven insights and through mobilizing action with those insights. So today we're talking about measuring and understanding impact from energy access. And let me just start by asking why that is important or answering rather why that is important. Um, after two decades of per capita income growth outpacing those of rich countries, economic activity in sub-Saharan Africa has in fact decelerated over the past decade, uh, driven by many reasons, external developments, difficult domestic conditions, low commodity prices, etc. And the World Bank projects that uh, because of the pandemic, that economic growth is set to continue to decline and potentially driving Africa to its first recession in the past 25 years. Um, African policymakers thus need to develop a two-pronged strategy um, of saving lives and protecting livelihoods. 
and widespread energy access for small, medium, and large-scale commercial industrial activity is widely touted and acknowledged as one of the critical pillars for unlocking that livelihood creation opportunity, but also uh, strengthening the economy, uh, supporting on food security, and other development goals. And definitely we're seeing that energy and power infrastructure is one of the top priority areas for the Africa Union, for the AFDB, for the EU-Africa Partnership, and for the local high five here in Kenya, where I am, and many other national development strategies. And installed capacity is growing steadily, uh, though a lot more investment is needed in transmission infrastructure and utility upgrading. Um, but especially in reaching rural communities, decentralized technologies or distributed energy resources led by the companies that you see here, uh, which are our, our, our uh, organization partners, these have actually become quite an important vehicle for driving delivery of energy access. Next slide. In fact, from January to June of 2019, over 4 million quality certified solar lanterns uh, and multi-light and solar home system, sy systems were sold uh, across the continent, and over 4,000 mini-grids are currently in different stages of development. The IEA suggests that to achieve universal energy access by 2030, a third of all new connections on the continent would be served at least cost by mini-grids, as you're seeing here on the left-hand side of the, of the chart. Um, and note that just four years ago, the IEA didn't really include decentralized renewables in their modeling frameworks at all. Um, framework for the sector is increasing, um, although nowhere near where the, uh, the sustainable energy for all estimates it needs to be. So there's an acknowledged role um, for off-grid or decentralized energy technologies to play, but targeted policy from donors and from governments um, that can help these markets grow is still sorely lacking. Next slide. On this slide, uh, you'll see, great, uh, the result of a comprehensive study our team did a few years ago, scoring government documents to identify energy access targets country by country. Um, we found that, in fact, 73% of low energy access countries, so those are those where less than half of the rural population has access to electricity, do not have decentralized renewable energy targets, as you can see in the gray and in the blue, and more than a third uh, have no energy access targets at all. That's, that's uh, within the grid. So one of the biggest gaps that has been identified by the sector, um, not through just this study, but through uh, stake, uh, stakeholder engagement with decentralized renewable energy companies um, and government stakeholders, uh, one of the biggest gaps has been uh, identified as um, the lack of access to high quality impact data and to data driven models for decision making. Uh, governments considering electricity access interventions oftentimes lack the data and the models to weigh the trade-offs, if you will, and the time, timeliness of various electrification options and may unintentionally make choices that actually reduce the net benefits of electricity to, to the energy poor. So this is where, to answer the initial question, this is where rigorous methods to understand impact, not just at the level of the firm or the company, but also at the level of the sector comes in really handy. Any framework for calculating opportunity costs must be rooted in a thorough understanding of energy access's relationship to other SDG areas, such as, you know, as we were mentioning before, poverty reduction, food security, sustainable agriculture, um, you know, uh, equitable quality uh, education, gender empowerment, etc. And so curating that body of research that identifies and measures these impacts and draws them into common analytical frameworks that decision makers can use is a timely and highly critical applied research challenge um, for the sector. And so that's why this topic that we're discussing today is actually quite important. Next slide. So realizing that there is both this lack of discussion and coordination happening between the policy silos and also a lack of rigorous data on impact um, to inform the directionality of local policy, we started a campaign a few years ago called the Energy Access Dividend to solve for these two issues by encouraging stakeholders across those ministerial lines to work together and also to bring rigorous, actionable research on impacts or dividends, if you will, into the sector to drive policy. Next slide. We started with healthcare, agriculture, and job creation. Uh, three major pillars for many uh, local, um, local development strategies. And we've actually seen, over the course of the past couple of years, we've actually seen impact data uh, directly inform and shift the policy needle. 
through direct interaction with energy stakeholders in, as you can see here, Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, and Nigeria, three areas where our research team has had um, direct uh, engagement, we've seen data be worked into policies. Uh, in Sierra Leone, for instance, um, where we were able to support um, the zeroing out of import duties on solar, um, solar appliances and solar home systems, we saw that in less than two years, the market had grown by uh, 900% with imports of solar home products going from 2000 in the first half of 2016 to more than 20,000 units by the end of 2017. So in the remaining time that I have, uh, what I want to do is just walk you through at a high level our process for understanding impacts that the energy sector has on local job creation, just to, as an example, and explain how that type of impact analysis can directly inform policy. And then once we get to the discussion section, we can, of course, unpack other impact areas. Next slide. And so why, why the focus on, on jobs? Well, there are very few studies to date that provide reliable job counts for the renewable energy sector broadly and the decentralized renewable or off-grid energy sector more specifically. And importantly, not just are we looking at job counts to understand the impact that the sector could have on job creation, but vice versa, we actually don't have very good data on the specific skills gaps that challenge the sector. And in fact, um, human capacity is identified as one of the leading challenges or barriers to decentralized renewable energy sector growth. Um, so in 2018, we launched the Powering Jobs campaign and recently published uh, a few journal articles uh, based out of that research that demonstrates this impact between, or this linkage rather, between workforces and DRE market strengthening, and then conversely between DRE markets and job opportunities. Next slide. Um, next, next slide when you can, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and start just ta talking about it. Um, so there we go. Under, so using a, a research standard bottom-up jobs estimation methodology, uh, which is highly referenced in the academic literature, we conducted the first ever comprehensive jobs count for the, uh, no, you can stay on the slide before. Um, we conducted the first ever comprehensive jobs count for the DRE sector. Uh, essentially, what we did is we surveyed over Rebecca, there's a bit of a lag between when I change the slide and when, when you see it. I apologize oh, for that. I'll go back one worry, slide, not... but there's a, we have yes, a yeah, long, long time constant here. Okay. No worries. So um, what I was showing in that slide, uh, anyway, is that we basically surveyed over 100 companies across Nigeria and Kenya. Uh, gathering a representative sample uh, by, by doing that to estimate gross decentralized renewable energy access related employment in the 2017 to 2018 year at the country level. And we looked at direct formal jobs, direct informal jobs and productive use jobs. So with that single year's worth of data on jobs impacts, uh, we were able to normalize, we, normalization over our technology's lifetime isn't possible. Uh, so we calculate an employment factor for each technology um, and that's distinguished from a job coefficient, which you would normally see in the literature. Um, using that data, we were then able to calculate and understand what the, what the, um, what the entire market's uh, impact on jobs looks like. And using that data, we're also able to break the workforce down by job function, by gender, by youth representation, by um, retention and levels of compensation. So we can use statistical analysis and linear regression to basically determine the statistically significant relationships for each country sample. And as you can see on the bottom here, that's the reference to our paper, if anyone is interested to go and read that. Um, but lastly, beyond that, that data analysis, we were also able to contextualize the findings um, for these two countries, Kenya and Nigeria, through qualitative focus groups that we held um, both in December of 2018. Next slide. So we explored um, direct employment in the DRE sector, as I mentioned, both formally and informally. And in terms of scope of the technologies that we covered, um, it was a very broad study that looked at small pico solar products of you know, less than 10 watts uh, that power a few light bulbs and phone charging stations to solo home systems of roughly 200 watts or more that can power basic appliances. We also covered standalone and grid tied um, CNI systems that range from a few hundred to multiple kilowatts and mini grid systems, as well as um, 
uh, solar irrigation and a few productive use um, areas. And next slide. And what we basically found, um, so just to give an, a very quick overview of some of our results, we found that the scale of and of job creation from decentralized renewables um, directly, i.e. by working for companies within the decentralized renewable energy space is actually on the order of the on-grid solar sector in India. Uh, we also did a study for India, but didn't publish those results. Um, it's on the order of national utility companies uh, in Kenya and the electricity, gas, and steam sector in Nigeria. So already this nascent sector is having quite some impact um, through direct formal jobs. But more interestingly, and also more importantly than that, we found that informally, there's quite a lot of, um, of jobs creation or livelihood creation, I would, I would say rather. And we saw that uh, according to the early estimates, the sector might be employing or might be contributing rather to um, fivefold, if not more, uh, jobs through productive use applications. Um, so right now we're actually doing a study or, or fundraising for a study to specifically look at the productive use side of jobs creation. And we've also just published a study that looks at, at um, jobs directly from, uh, from clean cooking. Next slide. Um, I won't get into, since I've only got a few minutes, I'm not going to get into the full extent of the results of that survey, and I, I can, I'm happy to share that information later on, but just wanted to give you one example of what kind of workforce profile information we're able to come up with. So here is a look at mini grid operators workforce profile for Kenya, and as you can see, we've got data on the level of engagement, how many people employed in the mini grid sector in Kenya are full-time engaged versus contractual, we understand a lot about job function. So how much of this is business uh, administration and management versus manufacturing and assembly, uh, R&D, product development, etc. Um, we also understand the gender breakdown, the skills breakdown between skilled and unskilled, and of course, um, the, um, the age breakdown. And that information is really important because that allows us to create very specific and very targeted recommendations working with local Kenyan stakeholders. For instance, um, one of the clear things that came out of this impact uh, analysis and study was that managerial skills uh, are in high demand across the entire sector from mini grids through to solar home systems and are identified as the most difficult to recruit. Um, so often there's, of course, a lot of emphasis on, on STEM fields and so on, but this actually you know, shows the interdisciplinary nature of the sector and the need for more, um, for more soft skills training um, for those coming into it. Um, another thing that we, we um, another uh, bit of information that we found out from the study um, was that across the sector, again, general business soft skills are critically lacking. Uh, which again, you know, um, include things like leadership, finance, strategic planning, communications, etc. Um, and there's a really clear opportunity here for industry associations to, and the, of course, technical vocational institutions and, and our universities to really fill that gap. And then we also, of course, from this uh, data are able to understand challenges around youth engagement, around recruitment. Uh, so we have very targeted challenge, very targeted uh, results uh, or recommendations rather that can come out of, of these types of findings. Next slide. And that will be my last one. So what this all led to was basically, as I mentioned, we've published the, 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 um, the research, but more than that, we were basically able to publish a series of reports in many different forms, white papers, fact sheets, infographics. Uh, we've run webinars, et cetera, to sort of socialize the findings. And what that led to was a very widespread readership. Um, uh, in fact, we had like 14 million, you know, potential impressions on Twitter and more than um, 60 uh, blog posts, more than 60 articles published um, with Forbes, Quartz, Reuters, World Economic Forum, BBC Africa, CNBC Africa, etc. on this on this research. Um, and that all led to, um, and we also had very local, um, we had local uh, launches and that led to a lot of opportunity to engage local recruitment agencies and local stakeholders. And from that, we've, we were able to establish the, um, the Sustainable Energy and Jobs Platform, which has been coordinated now by the ILO and IRENA. And a number of these recommendations have been directly incorporated uh, by local recruitment agencies already. So let me just stop there. I didn't want to, um, I don't want to go over my time, but I just basically wanted to, um, to demonstrate uh, the use of impact data at the level of the sector um, and what that can do for driving uh, targeted policy, both at the donor level and at the policy, at the, uh, at the government stakeholder level. Uh, so thanks, Henry. That's, that's it for me.
Thanks, Rebecca. F fantastic presentation. Uh, we'll move on next to uh, to uh, Kat Harrison with 60 decibels. Kat. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm always happy to follow Rebecca. I love hearing her speak. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to spend a bit of time today telling you about uh, the way that 60 decibels measures impact. So all about listening to people who matter most, the customers and the beneficiaries. Um, and we really believe that, you know, the only way to really understand impact to measure effectively is to listen to those that we're, we're trying to serve. You know, so often m and &E is focused on ticking a box, reporting to donors or putting a big number on a website. And, and so our work is less about proving impact and much more about supporting others to improve their impact. Um, and I think the only way to really do that effectively is to listen and to measure uh, and then make informed decisions to manage. So the perceived wisdom is that data collection is complex, costly and results can be biased. Um, and that can be really true, but we can avoid, minimize, mitigate for much of this. Um, so let me introduce you to 60 decibels. We're a customer insights and impact company known for our lean data approach. We focus on supporting um, impact investors, funders, foundations, social enterprises, companies, NGOs to grow their business or operations while maximizing their impact performance. Um, we do this through remote serving with stakeholders. We've conducted over 130,000 interviews across 40 countries of the globe uh, with over 300 social enterprises and companies. So we've learned a lot about what it means to do it effectively. Um, we predominantly use mo mobile phone surveys to conduct interviews 100% uh, of the time right now, obviously with COVID. Um, and we have a local research team we've recruited and trained to collect the data. So they speak directly to customers, end users and families in local languages. Um, and we only use locals of the countries we're working in to really give that uh, cultural context and, and awareness. Um, and we're customer centric as well ourselves. So we focus on the lean in lean data. So our interviews take around 15 minutes and we focus on ensuring it's a good experience for respondents. Um, often data collection can be incredibly extractive. So we try to really think about how it can be an enjoyable experience as well as get us lots of insight. Um, so at the core, what we've really done is designed and tested key questions to capture um, high quality data and insights that are valuable for growing enterprises and impact investors thinking where to place their capital. And so over the years of testing what does and doesn't work, we've created a standardized set of questions which have allowed us to create the first social impact benchmark. So we can aggregate all of this data together and then start to compare the results. So we can share with our partners, not just how they're doing, but how they're doing relative to peers. And this provides really helpful context for analysis and results and learning. Um, and we work really hard to turn all this complex data into beautiful, accessible results and importantly, actionable insights. So it's really used. Um, so before jumping into some of the data, I just wanted to take us back a little bit around what this is really all about. You know, so often we focus on presenting numbers in Indeed, I'm just about to. Um, but all of these numbers represent many individual voices, families using solar home systems in their houses, customers being served by off-grid mini grids, um, and respondents struggling with the effects of co the COVID pandemic right now. And so we really focus on capturing the voices of customers and sharing their experiences um, and use this to frame and measure impact to help inform um, discussion and decisions. So a helpful framework for thinking about impact uh, that we've used a lot is across three dimensions. So breadth being the first one, how many people are being served or, or supported by this intervention company program, whatever it might be, who is being served, and then depth of impact, how meaningful or transformative is the product or the service or the intervention. Um, organizations often only measure the breadth number and struggle with the who and the depth dimension. Um, so here's just a, a quick sort of overview of how we start to tackle some of that. Um, so the core indicators that we use to capture customer profile, experience, satisfaction, feedback and impact. So we look at the poverty level of respondents, what income level they're living at, whether the, their quality of life has changed as a result, result of the, the energy product and, and how that's changed, whether they're experiencing any challenges using that product or that service and how well they're being supported by the enterprise serving them. 
and we capture satisfaction using the net promoter score um, and look to understand whether companies are providing access for the first time. So just a bit of a snapshot there. And with this, here are some of the types of insights we can pull out. Taken, um, this is taken from our Why Off-Grid Energy Matters report we published early this year. Um, so the results here are taken from interviews with customers of nearly 50 off-grid energy companies, so a really nice mix across the sector. Um, and what we really saw is that you know, nearly nine in 10 of the 35,000 customers we talked to um, said that their quality of life had improved thanks to their solar home system, their lantern or their, their mini grid connection. Um, families talked about better light, reliability and convenience. They mentioned reduced spending and increased income. And they told us of the health improvements and well-being the products brought to their lives. For the vast majority of the customers, it was their first time accessing modern energy. And while productive use, so, so linked to uh, a little bit what Rebecca's talking about, while uh, customers using their energy for income generation is, is not a core function of energy products at the moment in general, um, the impact it has for those customers powering their bars or restaurants or small businesses um, is significant. And so when we look across the subsectors using these standardized indicators, we saw some really interesting patterns as well. Um, in an impact index we created, I'll show you just after this, we have found that solar lanterns were doing the best. So providing a product that had meaningful impact on people's lives. Um, it's not because the quality or quantity of the light they provide is better. Um, in fact, it tends to be more basic, but that these products are the first step of the modern energy staircase for many. And it's when customers take that first step that the greatest marginal impact occurs. So lots of positive we're able to share, but what we really, really want to focus on is these actionable insights. So there's some areas we really identified for what needs to be addressed as well. Um, we see that 37% of off-grid energy customers live below the poverty line. That compares to 60% in the population of the countries they live in. So the customers are not representative of you know, the population um, suggesting the sector really needs to focus attention on how we serve those low income customers, particularly if we're going to achieve SDG 7 and, and not leave anyone behind. And a third of customers also told us they'd experienced challenges using their energy product or service. So two thirds of them hadn't had that issue resolved. So poor customer service was, you know, it, it came up as a top complaint against customers um, who were dissatisfied. So while the challenges may be technical um, due to mismatched expectations because of misuse folks so addressed in very different ways, what's key is that there are impact and business or scale implications out of that. If a family can't use their solar home system properly for whatever reason, they can't experience the benefits from its use and they're unlikely to recommend that product or talk positively about it to their friends and family, which might affect um, uptake and, and, um, and scale. And lastly, we're already starting to understand the negative impacts that financing might have. So many of these energy access, off-grid energy access companies are offering pay-as-you-go or asset financing to make products more accessible and affordable. Um, but, it, but what we're finding, although uh, over-indebtedness is not a massive problem exper experienced by many people, it's a really important problem for those that experience it. And actually, this has got dramatically worse as a result of the COVID pandemic. So something to really watch out for. Um, so just quickly to show you the impact index working, the outside triangle is the maximum impact, the inside is the minimum, and the corners are who in terms of poverty reach, uh, what in terms of quality of life, and contribution in terms of people's first access to this new uh, modern energy. Um, and this report was all about energy access, but this enabled us, as I mentioned, with the, the um, aggregated indicators to look at performance across different subsectors. So as I said, when we saw that solar lanterns, that purple triangle, they're having the biggest impact, mainly because they serve low income populations, are many families first access to modern lighting and therefore have a big impact on quality of life. Um, solar home systems are providing really solid impact across the board, that yellow triangle. Um, appliances like solar TVs, solar water pumps and off-grid refrigerators are not doing as well, the, the green one, um, but they're a nascent market so there's lots of opportunities for improvement and growth. 
And so this type of information can really help investors determine where to deploy capital to shape their portfolio or where technical support might be uh, helpful as well. And then we can turn this type of information at an aggregate or portfolio level into something even more insightful for, for other stakeholders. So this is the net promoter score. It's used globally as a proxy for customer satisfaction and loyalty. It tells you a little bit. It's kind of a really nice temperature gauge of how customers or end users are feeling. Um, 100 is the best, minus 100 is the worst. And so again, you can see that solar lanterns are, are, are doing great. Um, so each company in our benchmark is a line here, colored by the type of product. So this is the, the slide before just pulled out. Um, and we found that ranking can be really helpful to see how uh, different companies are, or um, projects are doing relative to their peers. For us then, we can start to identify what the characteristics of the highest performing companies or projects are, those on the right of this screen. What business models do they have? What policies or practices do they employ? And that's where the data becomes actionable because we can start to provide recommendations or ideas for consideration for those not doing so well, those across on the left. Um, and just lastly, recently, we've been doing a lot of work on listening during the COVID pandemic. Um, as the pandemic spread around the world early this year, there was a flurry of data coming out, but much of it was around um, gathered via online surveys, uh, which misses the lived experience of 50% of the world's population who are not connected to internet. Uh, and so that meant it was really missing, um, in general, lower income um, uh, populations predominantly living in the developing world. So without hearing their voices, governments, companies, NGOs and aid agencies are flying blind in developing their COVID response. So our team mobilized to uh, listen to these customer or end user family voices about what's happening in their lives, how they're coping with challenging situations and, and what unmet needs they still have. And so since April, we've interviewed over 12,000 customers across 14 countries to understand awareness and concern of COVID and the impact of COVID, particularly around financial health and vulnerability. And we've put all of this data up on a publicly um, accessible dashboard, hopefully to help inform those wanting to learn and to respond. Um, and as part of that, we designed the vulnerability index to identify how shocks like the pandemic affect a family situation. So what you're seeing here is um, across each country, the index, which is made up of data looking at the poverty level of the customer, the impact of the shock on uh, household financial situations, coping mechanisms families were using, such as using savings, selling their assets, having to borrow money, and the effect on food consumption, which tends to be a really high signal of, of high stress where families start to reduce their intake. Um, so this chart shows all of our data a, a few weeks back, admittedly, <laughs> um, for energy customers. And you can see there's big differences by country. So 53% of families we talked to in Rwanda are categorized as very or extremely vulnerable, but just 5% in Tanzania are. Um, so some really interesting trends started to emerge when we explored what might be shaping this. Um, I've popped a link into, a, we just uh, published a Next Billion article which shared a lot of what those trends are. So I'll save a bit of time for other speakers and um, just share that link there. Um, but I just wanted to share, um, importantly, that this is an example of how we all need to review, adjust, pivot our work to ensure we're bringing the most value to, um, that we can to support those to better understand, deliver, and be informed to act. Um, after all, data's great, but it's what you do with it that really counts. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, I put the links here, but I'll also just share it in the chat and um, handing back to, to Henry and our next speakers. Wonderful, very, very uh, interesting presentation, Kat. Uh, we'll move on, uh, we'll just keep rolling and uh, I believe Aaron, you are next. Muted, Aaron. I think you're still muted. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. Okay. Thanks, Louis, for the um, for the introduction, and uh, thanks, Kat. It's always um, great to hear. 
can't talk about 60 decibels work because it's uh, you're always so passionate about it and it's very interesting. So my name is Aaron Eels. Um, I'm from the University of Strathclyde and my talk today is on the social impact of mini grids, specifically uh, a toolkit about the monitoring and evaluation and learning um, of mini grids. Um, it's mostly about the toolkit, but I'm also working as a uh, practitioner installing microgrids in Malawi. So there are some insights from our work in Malawi as we go along. So to start off with, um, the motivations for the toolkits, as Rebecca covered, uh, mini grids have got a big part to play in achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, about 31%, as she mentioned, of uh, customers not yet connected should be getting mini grids. Um, Despite the growing sector, they're still relatively nascent, uh, with the main focus today uh, of the evaluations that have been done of being technological and, and business related. And uh, from our research, we found that there's a lack of understanding really of what the real social impacts are. And by understanding them better, we'll be able to uh, provide an evidence base for supporting the claims of the mini grids and be able to make them more effective and ultimately better at reducing poverty. So the toolkit itself was developed in partnership with Practical Action and, and Carbon Trust. Um, the objectives were to understand what the real impacts are and, and co-develop a methodology for monitoring and evaluation. It's supposed to be pragmatic for the use of um, practitioners and researchers, and it just outlines tools and guidelines that uh, follow best practice for, for m and &E, um, and how to do it and how to use it. This presentation is basically going to run through the, the eight steps of the, the toolkit framework, um, which are listed here, obtaining institutional buy-in, developing a theory of change, developing key performance indicators, developing data collection tools, processes, reporting and sharing, actually using the data, and then some um, at the end about research and evaluation. So the first step, um, if you are a, a mini grid practitioner, is to really um, institutionalize M&E within your organization um, to prove that it's important and to define some roles and responsibilities uh, of who's doing what, clearly communicate to the staff so they can see why m and is important, how it's used and how it influences decision making. And that's a first step that you can do in an organizational strategy before you get down to designing the M&E strategy. And the first step of that is to develop a theory of change. Now there's quite a lot of information on theory of change online, but ultimately it's a way of giving a description or an illustration of how and why a desired change is expected to happen in a particular context. And that context is really important. It's broken down into four levels. We start with the impact level. What's the, the change that you wanna see? What's the impact that you want to achieve? and then what conditions are necessary to achieve these impacts in the outcome level. We then look at what outputs are necessary to achieve these outcomes and then tie those into specific activities that you can do as a mini grid pr practitioner to achieve these outputs. I think it's important to include in the context any assumptions or risks that your theory of change covers and to develop it in a participatory manner with this wider range of stakeholders that are involved and when displaying it or sharing it, diagrams are a really useful tool to, to get across your theory of change. Once you have your theory of change, you then need to develop some key performance indicators, which can be used to, to track and quantify the progress of any activities. And they're then linked to the outputs, the outcomes and the impact to achieve your theory of change. So I've listed a few here, for example, you've technical um, that are looking at the household, business and community services, um, how much electricity they're using. Uh, you can track the number of customers, the community services connected. Um, you can look at the household level or productive uses of energy, uh, specifically for what Rebecca was talking about, looking at the number of new jobs created or the energy cost savings made by businesses are very important. And then depending on your theory of change, you might want to have a deeper dive into gender or education or health or social. I put a list up here because the toolkit comes along with a, a shared spreadsheet that's got a long list of indicators that practitioners can use and they can pick and choose which indicators um, correspond to their theory of change. And depending on their resources, they can have a look at how much of a deep dive they want to go into. 
Once you've got your indicators, uh, you need to develop the tools to collect them. Now, most smart, most mini grids that are coming online are coming with smart meters to collect data on generation and consumption. In Malawi, we're using Steamaco smart meters, which allow for hourly insight on customer energy use and payment frequencies. And we can track customer journeys uh, through the social surveys against how much electricity they're using and how much um, uh, money they're spending on, on payment. These meters are normally logging every hour um, and then they're uploaded to a, a, a digital server that can be accessed either through an online dashboard or downloaded as a spreadsheet. So the technical data can be analyzed alongside surveys um, and speaking to customers face to face um, is, a, is a really useful way of getting insight for both qualitative and quantitative data. Um, in Malawi, we've used trained uh, enumerators um, using a software called Kobo Toolbox, uh, which allows uh, smartphones to collect data, also taking pictures, GPS coordinates, videos, but that data is uploaded to the cloud as soon as the survey is complete and we can access it and troubleshoot if there's any problems with the survey in real time. Uh, from our experience in Malawi, it's really important that the, the enumerators understand the local culture, the context, and obviously speak the local language, do a translation test on the surveys before they go out. And then tracking quantitative data can be looked at alongside the smart meters, but qualitative data uh, can be really useful to just gain a bit more insight um, into the sort of aspects that, that, that Kat's been finding out through conversations with people. And other tools to get more qualitative information, um, if you want to, uh, include focus group discussions and expert interviews. Once you've got your tools, you then need to develop the framework for collecting these processes. You need roles and responsibilities within the organization of who's going to do it and when. And it's important to set baselines and then targets for when you're going to achieve the, the, the indicator targets for your theory of change. And these different processes can be tailored depending on what the practitioner has available in terms of resources, or what, what data is required to fulfill their terms of um, theory of change. So I've listed some processes here. You've got uh, site selection surveys, customer acquisition surveys, looking at the PUE in more detail, the micro-entrepreneur training surveys, customer impact surveys or focus group discussions or expert interviews. And these can be conducted uh, depending on availability of field staff and resources to send them out, either six monthly or yearly or even more often if you, if you can afford it. And there's a list here of who might be surveyed and it's important to know who those are and what the purpose of the m and &E is, either to get some key KPIs, key performance indicators, or to get more qualitative data to inform your business model or the funders. Once you're collecting data, uh, you can fill in the, the framework by tracking the actual values for each indicator against planned or targets, planned targets. So in your design, you should align your surveys and other m and &E activities along with key milestones in the KPA, KPI tracking framework and make sure there's roles and responsibilities for doing the analysis, the regular reporting and then that can come up with a supporting narrative that then can be provided on a regular basis for whoever wants to use the data, which I'll come on to in a minute. So once you have this very valuable, important data, uh, what do you then do with it? Well, the first, uh, first useful and, and quite straightforward thing to do with the data is, is looking at the project performance. And that's comparing your KPIs and the performance of the, the mini grid against how much it's cost to get there. So by tracking this, uh, this project spend against indicator, actual indicators, you can come up with um, indicators such as cost per connection, cost per kilowatt hour, and cost per megawatt. And investors or funders will be very interested in, in this, um, these parameters to, to be tracking the performance of the, the project. However, the more in depth or the qualitative data uh, needs to be an al analyzed to, to basically make recommendations to, to progress your business as a whole, but also to progress the, the, the microgrid, the mini grid sector as a whole. And people that might be interested in uh, the an analysis and insights from your data are other practitioners uh, that can inform technical design and business model optimization, uh, governments so that you can do some advocacy for smart subsidies and policy change, 
investors are interested in de-risking their investments, promoting awareness and justifying their social impact motivations, but also enhancing their public image. Donors are obviously very interested to design their programs to be more effective and to have increased social impact. And for practitioners, having that data will increase their chances of getting future funding. And then finally, I think it's important for some of the M&E data to be fed back to the customers or the beneficiaries, just so that they can be more aware of what your wider plans are and what the impact that you're having, and they feel more engaged with the project itself. And that's been something we've, uh, we've stressed in our projects in, in Malawi. The final part of the, the presentation is that the, the toolkit that I presented is mostly for, for monitoring and learning. The evaluation part is, is slightly more tricky and um, to really get a deep dive into what impact uh, electrification is having in rural communities, you need to do longitudinal research studies and social impact evaluations. And microgrid practitioners don't always have the, the time or the resources to do these and they need to team up with research institutions to, to conduct it. A quick example is that in some of the, the interventions we've done in Malawi, we have found that school uh, performance has increased, uh, you know, exam results have, have got better, uh, but we can't directly attribute that to an electricity connection because it may well be to a new headmaster or a new school feeding program. And so, um, however, it could be that we have made a contribution to those certain impacts and to, to find that out um, in a deep dive, we need to conduct longitudinal research studies and there's not really enough of those that are happening at the moment and practitioners should partner with research institutions to do that wherever possible. So these slides will be available afterwards and I'll put them up um, at the end of the session, but the, the report, which is the toolkit, is available up on ResearchGate. The accompanying spreadsheet is, um, is available with all the key performance indicators. And there's another published academic paper, which is a literature review of what we understand of, of social impacts um, of, of mini grids and the justification for the toolkit itself. With that, I'll finish and, and pass on to the next, uh, the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. So we'll move on to our uh, final uh, presenter, Dr. Kadra, please. Okay. You see my slides? Okay. Um, thank you, I'm Aparna Katri uh, at the University of Minnesota in Duluth. So I'm going to talk about ex post evaluation of sustainability um, of community owned mini grid solutions, particularly. And these are pertaining to remote communities. That's kind of interest for me, particularly um, coming from India and sort of, you know, exposed. So I have some affinity towards that scenario and that motivated a lot of my research work. Um, in this, today I'm going to talk about the framework we developed with uh, a group of collaborators on how to conduct sustainability evaluation and also talk about a couple of cases where we applied the framework and uh, performed the um, evaluation. So our goal here is to really, if you look at um, the literature on you know, evaluating and understanding the uh, sustainability of mini grid solutions, uh, different models are popping up all over and when we look at the frameworks that had been designed um, to date you know most of them looked at um, you know maybe a couple of dimensions like evaluate technical sustainability financial sustainability um, and then if you look at these frameworks they were really focused on uh, comparing different kinds of models rather than understanding and evaluating whether a given model of in the way in which a mini grid is implemented uh, can be sustainable in the long run and therefore can it be scaled um, you know to promote greater use of the mini grids in different communities so that kind of motivated us to look at uh, develop a comprehensive rigorous and somewhat context specific framework because the situation of remote communities is a little different than sort of you know urban areas or um, inner city kind of areas so with that uh, in mind, we looked at developing the framework. And to do this, we, what, the, what we came up with is a framework that is multidimensional, um, looks at multi-levels 
in, when it comes to data and analysis both. And also it takes a multi-tiered approach so that while we're looking at the um, sustainability at a certain level, is there a way to then uh, increase the sustainability or increase the impact that can be achieved? So it's multi-dimensional, multi-level and multi-tiered. So if you look at multiple dimensions, literature review, you know, looked at these sort of five dimensions that we show here. And when we look at um, evaluating uh, and developing a framework, we take the approach by taken by various developmental initiatives, those of defining the dimensions, measures, indicators kind of approach um, to say, how do we conceptualize sustainability along these five dimensions? Uh, to give you an example, if you look at economic sustainability, then in, when we look at remote communities and you look at um, sort of village level energy solutions, uh, in this case, um, economic sustainability can be thought of as um, concerned with the cost effectiveness of the solution, the capital costs that are involved, the recovery time that is involved, and the system's contribution to creating livelihoods in the community. So we conceptualize, give a definition for each dimension of sustainability, and from there we define the measures that can be used. So in this case, we come up with two measures of uh, is the model sustainable, financial sustenance, and the contribution to livelihood uh, in the communities. So for each of these measures, then we define indicators underlying to uh, capture the uh, information. And in some cases, we have more than one indicators that roll up to calculating the measure itself. So for example, if you look at uh, model sustenance, uh, in this case, the indicators that underlying indicators that are used will be if you assume that the model is, um, you know, largely capital costs are covered through donations and grants, and then model sustenance is really dependent on, um, you know, are the tariffs able to cover all of the O&M costs, including battery replacement costs. So in which case, um, the kinds of indicators we are interested in looking at is what is the cash reserve at any point in time, and that can help us to get to um, the, uh, and what are the tariffs, uh, what is the ability to collect tariffs, so we look at those indicators that will allow us to then arrive at a conclusion on the model sustenance. So we have 12 measures across these five dimensions and a number of different in the underlying indicators behind us. Now, when it comes to the data for the indicators themselves, uh, we look at two things. We look at both qualitative and quantitative data. And we use both in order to arrive at the indicators um, and the measures and the scores for each measure and for each dimension. Um, so qualitative data is collected through um, focus groups, some open-ended questions in the surveys, as well as through um, semi-structured interviews. Quantitative data is largely survey-based. Um, in terms of data collection, data to evaluate the entire implementation at the village level, we look at data that is collected at multiple levels, beginning with households, where a certain percentage of households in a village are sampled and surveyed uh, using stratified sampling method because we want to make sure that there is adequate representation, particularly of households that are like in the outskirts of the village versus those that are at the center of the village, for example. Uh, data that is uh, system specific at the village level, plant data, uh, financial data at the village level, we need to collect that. Um, also, in terms of institutions, because these are remote communities, um, essentially there has to be a significant community ownership in this process and for day-to-day -day administration and governance. So in data uh, with sort of village energy committees that may be formed or the plant operators, so institutional level um, data collection, largely qualitative uh, is necessary and also with other stakeholders that are involved if there is an implementing agency, primary implementing, implementing agency, then interviews with them, funders, as well as often there are NGOs involved in these communities, so interviews with them. So it's kind of multi-level and both qualitative and quantitative data. Now, if you look at the scoring methodology for each indicator and then measure, what we uh, came up with is for each um, measure, we look at uh, the different indicators and we look at take a tiered approach. So World Bank has the tiered approach, multi-tiered approach for technical sustainability. 
we took that approach and extended it to institutional economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And we basically said there are five tiers, defined the benchmark and criteria, uh, what would sort of model sustenance look like when it is score one or tier one to tier five. So then we use the data to then compare against those benchmarks and arrive at scores. The data that is used is both uh, qualitative data actually adds rich descriptions. Um, we also uh, use a Delphi method so that there are multiple researchers that are um, uh, in the evaluation team that's actually analyzing independently and negotiating and then arriving at final scores. So with this scoring methodology, um, we then applied this to, um, we basically looked at the evaluation for uh, mini grids using this methodology. And we did a complete evaluation for um, the sites of Garam Urja, that's a social enterprise in India, providing village level energy solutions, particularly in remote communities. So this particular study that I'm reporting here is, um, was done, I think in 2017, I believe the data collection happened then. Um, at that time they had 24, you know, mini grids in across four different states, uh, three different states, sorry, in different clusters. So we did sort of 100% um, data collection across their um, mini grids including village level qualitative and quantitative data collection and discussions with funders, um, the uh, Gramurja staff, as well as various NGOs that were involved in these different sites. So what did we learn from this evaluation? Um, so basically what we found is that um, certain preconditions have to be met for the systems to be technically, economically, and institutionally sustainable in the long term. And those preconditions are, first of all, technical proficiency, which means that um, basic high quality reliable supply of electricity has to happen. If those conditions for whatever reason are not being fulfilled, then um, it affects all kinds of other dimensions of sustainability. So that's kind of a precondition in many ways. Second precondition has to do with the social, what we are calling a social interaction. And that is largely to do with community participation um, you know, between the NGO and the communities, between the service provider and the community. So that social interaction uh, is a crucial component to achieve what we are calling as effective local governance. Um, when there is community participation and effective local governance, that actually affects the sustainability of economic sustainability, because then there is better tariff collection and better tracking and monitoring that happens of the financial aspects um, of the system at the local level, and that leads to user satisfaction and environmental impact, social and environmental outcomes that are expected. Now, in this case, we are not saying this is causality necessarily, because we don't have, we haven't empirically tested the causality, but if you look at implementations that did better or worse, even within the 24 mini grids, that's kind of what surfaced uh, in this model for us. Now, there are, of course, a lot of challenges here that we observed, um, which is the consumption. In many cases, the, um, the supply was higher and consumption actually did not go up just because there was supply. So remote communities particularly seem to be uh, limited by the mindset um, that they have in these areas. And I don't want to call them like tribal mindset. Many of them were tribal communities, but it's like this is a precious thing and we need to be careful in how much we use and that kind of effect to growth in the demand for energy. Um, so we this kind of suggests that there has to be support and intervention to integrate productive use of energy um, for the use of electricity. Now, this last finding particularly and the centrality of community participation motivated us to explore community participation in greater detail because we know this is necessary, but how does community participation happen and how broad and deep does it need to be in order for the systems to be sustainable? So we went and did a little bit more deeper work in um, the community participation side and uh, came up with a framework to understand and evaluate 
community participation. And we came up with six different dimensions of community participation. Uh, this is based on other development work that's happened largely in the healthcare sectors uh, in developing countries. And uh, these areas are based off of those as, and the definitions of each of these came from our previous work that I just cited here. Um, and what we see, for example, when it comes to energy needs in a community, and again, remember, I'm still talking about remote communities. Energy needs uh, has to do with, you know, identifying and negotiating energy needs rather than being kind of superimposed by somebody else. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kadre, we are running out of time. So if you could wrap it up in the next okay, minute sure. or two. Thank you. Um, so energy. Am I unmuted here? and scoring criteria from like the previous ones on a five-point scale and we conducted an evaluation again of sustainability and community participation in um, 15 different communities remote communities and in this case there were many different um, entities involved some government-led and some private sector-led so here is how we then summarize the scores came that came from these different installations um, and we tried to sort of use the spider web to guide our final analysis, uh, deeper analysis. I'll jump to the final analysis. So if we had a wide range of mini grids that had failed and were non-operative and some that were completely operative and doing really well and then across the spectrum. Uh, what we found in terms of those differentiating, what differentiated the more sustainable ones from the less ones is really three factors that local developmental agency, their role, grassroots organizations uh, working with communities is extremely crucial in this process. And the social capital they have working with communities played a big role in getting the systems to be right, community participation, and therefore sustainability. Um, the second one has to do with the social capital that is formed between the solution provider and local developmental agency. That has to be uh, come in much earlier than the designing of the system itself. And the third is because these are remote communities, local capacity building is extremely crucial and therefore long-term accountability, not just for implementation, but over an extended duration is necessary across these different players. And that, is, uh, that can be measured. And the tiered approach actually allows us to then um, measure these and improve this over time. So in interest of time, I'll stop here and take questions as we go forward. There are a couple studies published. I can put them in chat later on. And these are our collaborators here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we will uh, now move on to the uh, question and, and answer uh, part of it. I, I think you can see the slide that I have now. Um, before we get into that, um, there is a way of giving feedback uh, about this panel. It would be helpful if you could um, uh, take a, a moment or two afterwards to do it. We, I have asked uh, the panelists if they're able to stay uh, for a few minutes longer uh, past our um, original stopping time. And, and um, uh, it looks like most of them are able to. And I'll turn it over to Peter at this point to uh, ask a couple of questions on behalf of the audience. Take it away, Peter. Sure, great. Um, thanks, uh, panelists, for the amazing presentations. Uh, I was excited at the start and uh, definitely satisfied. Uh, it was really, really great um, content there. Um, uh, I want to start with a question for uh, Dr. Rebecca Shirley. Um, I came in uh, from uh, the name SB Mobile. Uh, the question is, uh, how and where are impact metrics around jobs and productive uses expected to find the most influence and resonance among South, South uh, I should say, Sub-Saharan Africa policymakers with respect to the off-grid market? Uh, and I'm going to just reframe that a little bit uh, and invite also the other panelists to comment if they choose to. Um, uh, this is this question is talking about job metrics uh, being used by policymakers. Uh, what examples uh, have been used where they've actually done that, or what are the sort of ideal uses uh, that you'd like to see them do? Uh, and if the other panelists want to talk either about job metrics or other metrics and how decision-making is being driven from that, uh, that might be a, a similar 
sort of question. Sure thing. Uh, thanks for that, Peter. Um, and it's a good question. So essentially, I can talk about this because of um, what we've seen happen with at the at the um, uh, after the uh, the impact assessment came out on on jobs. Um, and so what we've seen is that a lot of first of all, I should say that the reason, as I mentioned before, that we started in this area of of um of investigation was because of the policy demand uh, that we were seeing or the the demand rather from policymakers um i was in india just a few um just last year and we were speaking with the um center for green for for green jobs growth and uh, there they're saying that especially because in india you have sort of a more mature energy access sector where um uh you know mini grids and solar home systems are um, are sort of part and parcel of the electrification system, there's really a move now into this productivity space. And so, um, you know, stakeholders are wanting to understand, policy stakeholders are wanting to understand where exactly those jobs are being created and how they can support that through um, te technical and vocational training uh, and, through, um, and through finance as well. Um, so I think that the jobs numbers themselves, and this is kind of what Kat was jumping on, is, uh, was, was saying is that, uh, jumping off of is that the numbers themselves are sh sure they're important, but also it's more once you see what the impact could be and where the impact areas are, um, what policy does that, um, th does that lead to? Um, another example that we've seen is here in, in Kenya, um, Strathmore University, which is one of the leading universities, has directly taken these kinds of results and formulated executive training programs uh, for the energy sector, for energy sector professionals, uh, training programs for technicians. I think one of the questions I saw in the chat was about uh, engineers and technicians. And they're also developing a master's program um, to directly facilitate the sector. So you can see just those are some examples of ways that government stakeholders or university and academia um, might leverage these kinds of results. And thirdly, as I mentioned, of course, recruitment firms themselves know exactly where they need to target and how to connect certain types of um, CVs or applicants with what the sector itself needs. Uh, thanks very much. Just gonna pass the question to another panelist if, uh, if anyone else has a, another idea of how metrics would be used by decision makers and maybe a distinct example. Um, I can jump in just quickly, which is more to say, I think uh, Rebecca and I have this conversation regularly, I think. There are different ways to look at direct or indirect jobs. And I think the work that we do is much more around sort of productive use of energy from end users and customers. And I think what Rebecca looks at, or what she's been talking about here, much more is where in the market those companies are creating those jobs. And, and so I don't have a great answer to the question, but I think more just to sort of add that nuance of context is really interesting to think about how income generation more broadly, whether it's direct or indirect, can be um, supported by access to energy. And maybe just add to that, Kat, the, from, from the research that we've done, the, the jobs and more widely livelihood development is essential in achieving social impact. If rural communities have got more income, they can spend that on health and um, that more income has a, a knock-on effect in, in development. From a mini-grid uh, developer's point of view, um, a lot of domestic customers use energy at night, uh, which means bigger batteries and more expensive mini-grid systems. And if you can utilize that energy during the day through productive uses, it makes the, the microgrid business model um, more effective, bringing more income, and it has um, more economic input as well. So a big focus at the moment is, is promoting productive uses of energy through, um, through mini-grids. Peter, Rebecca again here, and I think I would also add to that, that just, to, you know, specifically to hone in on the metrics side of things, um, what we have and what you often see in the literature, especially for Sub-Saharan Africa, is um, FTE, full-time equivalencies for direct jobs. Um, but really, if we had, so, and that comes from bottom-up studies, like the one that I was describing, but really, if we had really, if we had proper economic input-output tables and data for a lot of these countries, we'd actually be able to develop more nuanced metrics metrics around induced jobs so where does fun where does finance or where does spending from energy access trickle down into other sectors of the economy and those kinds of statistics are usually very useful for governments because then they can follow sort of that trail and understand where they need to apportion finance and so on but um, i think there's beyond doing these bottom-up studies there are other areas of data that are that are needed and i know that institutions are 
currently working on some of those areas, but it's not a, it's not, um, it's definitely still an area of need. Great. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, change topic just slightly. Um, I don't think we have too much time, but uh, just uh, wanted to uh, take a question that was uh, asked by uh, uh, Dr. Louis to Aaron uh, about the most common mistakes that organizations uh, do in their M&E process. Um, and just uh, maybe, uh, you know, briefly, uh, all the panelists can say a, a few words on that, uh, starting with, with Aaron. Um, either in the, the process or, you know, maybe you've, uh, you've, you've made a mistake or, you know, something that you can share that can help others uh, avoid uh, some of the pitfalls uh, if they're getting started down this road. Sure. So um, in, in designing the toolkit and writing it, we, we spoke to about 10 uh, microgrid practitioners uh, working in sub-Saharan Africa and asked them about what their current M&E practices are, what the challenges they're finding and um, and what, what problems they're coming across. And uh, what we found is that mostly private sector um, practitioners don't have very much resources for M&E and they don't really consider it that important because uh, their main jobs are getting um, connections on the ground and developing microgrids. So if they do do any, any M&E, it's, um, it's what's required by the, the donor or, or by, the, by the funder. Um, and everyone that we did speak to said that they would be you know, really interested in finding out more um, to help them to help them develop their business plans, uh, but they just didn't have the the resources for it. So um, they also said that the um, any data that they got was sort of uh, designed in house and a little bit ad hoc or, or haphazard. And they all agreed that there was a need for a more structured. Um, formalized metrics um, that would help to, to um, increase the, the sector growth and, and to share the learnings and I guess that's where um, that's where some of Kat's work has, has come from maybe I'll pass on to Kat because I'm sure she's got some um, insights on, on M&E pitfalls. Thanks Aaron yeah do we have another hour no um... <laughs> I think, I mean, I think that's a lot of what our work is about, trying to think about how you can collect data and insights in a way that is valuable both for understanding impact and business insights. So I think my biggest kind of recommendation is identifying ways to collect data that has value across multiple aims. So collecting data just to report to a donor that, that just feels like such a, uh, such a shame for all of that data. And I think there's sometimes I actually think it's about language and terminology for example you know impact is synonymous with customer value proposition and and those words will resonate depending on who you're talking to so I think there's a lot of opportunities to think really carefully about a how to keep it simple and b how to keep it actionable and useful and really then building systems internally that are informing you know operations and strategy and design and delivery not just kind of reporting to, to, to donors or whoever those partners might be Great. Uh, we do have a lot of questions and apologies that we're not going to get to all of them here. Um, I wanted to ask one, one uh, quick question more, uh, I think is uh, sort of uh, following up on that uh, for Dr. Katre. Um, there was a question from uh, Robert Nutter talking about um, how did you decide on the 12 measures to assess and analyze? Uh, if you were expand the number of measures, what else would you include? And I think we've been kind of talking a little bit about, um, you know, the choices that you have to make and how you use them. Uh, and Kat, you just mentioned that uh, making sure that they're valuable at multiple levels is, is also key. So I, I think it's kind of in a similar sort of vein is, is uh, how do you really choose uh, those measures and how do you maybe rule some out uh, as maybe less interesting or less, uh, less valuable. Um, so Dr. Katre, if you, you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, obviously looking at, you know, the different studies and what others have done forms the basis to begin with, but really I would say the context is really, really important, especially when you're looking at, you know, certain contexts. I mean, obviously if you want to look at macro level, national level, then it's a different, uh, ball game, uh, entirely. But if you're looking at, you know, remote communities, if you're looking at, uh, you know, communities of certain size or certain geographical areas. So context is really important to factor into the measures. Is, that's what I feel from our experience here. Um, and then 
But then to begin with, give a definition to what does that sustainable dimension of sustainability mean for the context that we're talking about. And once you give that definition and explain what it means, then you can define what those measures need to be and what are important and prioritize and pick the most important measures. Because like others have said, you know, you can have too many of those, but context specific, most important things that are captured by the measures um, after you define what sustainability means in that context. And I think the third thing would be from our experience, what we realized is there are so many, particularly when there are too many players involved in this process, you don't want to drive the measures and indicators by, you know, say the funder necessarily, or just the government, you really want um, a community voice in this. So um, going back and also before you begin the study, to really understand what does that sustainability mean for the communities and capturing that in your measures. If I had to do this all over again, that would be one change I would make um, and not be driven by either the solution provider or the funder or government, you know, the interested parties per se, but really what it means for the communities. Okay, great. Well, uh, I appreciate everyone staying a bit later. Uh